Until little more than a decade ago, the conventional attack submarine was our only available vehicle for tactical operations beneath the sea. But obliged as it is to surface or snorkel to obtain air for machines and men, the conventional submarine has been operationally limited by its dependence on the Earth's atmosphere. The arrival of nuclear power has broken those bonds. Today's nuclear submarine can range the seas of the world completely submerged for months at a time. Its reactor, operable without air for hundreds of thousands of miles before refueling, self-sufficient to the extent that even the air its men need to breathe comes from the sea, the nuclear submarine has revolutionized man's conquest of the last great earthly frontier, the deep ocean. Leading the way, the United States Navy has developed the most sophisticated submarine in the world. The nuclear-powered attack submarine, the first line of defense against aggression on or under the surface of the sea. And the Navy has led the way in moving solid-fueled rocket technology into the deep ocean, developing fast reaction weapon systems with a reach so long and powerful that no land target in the world is beyond range. Weapons fired from the fleet ballistic missile submarine a nuclear-powered mobile launch platform so difficult to detect and defend against that together, missile and submarine form an undeniable strategic deterrent against possible aggression. Indeed, so potent is nuclear power that it has reformed our ideas of naval warfare under the seas. And in the next few minutes, we shall see how it has led to a new generation of submarines with unprecedented operational and mission capabilities. In the 1950s, a long period of research and development was culminating as a new source of energy was coming of age. Underway on nuclear power. The lines of the hull were familiar, but in almost every other respect, the Nautilus was a different class of underwater vehicle. In place of diesel engines and batteries, power both on the surface and below now came from a nuclear reactor generating steam to drive turbines for propulsion and auxiliary power. Nuclear reactors did not require air for their operation and new techniques made it possible to obtain unlimited quantities of fresh air for breathing while remaining submerged. Dependence on the atmosphere was over and done with. Submarines like these could operate underwater indefinitely. And the nukes soon confirmed that they could travel hundreds of thousands of miles, not for weeks but for years, on one load of reactor fuel. Nuclear submarines pioneered the way under the ice to the North Pole, showed they could surface by punching through the ice, and reconnoitered the fabled Northwest Passage while submerged. Triton, largest and most powerful submarine ever constructed, her twin screws driven by twin nuclear reactors, circumnavigated the globe, remaining continuously submerged and undetected. Nautilus and her sisters had proven conclusively that the link with the Earth's atmosphere had been broken and that there was no ocean shore on Earth that could not be reached at will under the sea. Fitted out as attack submarines, many of these conventional hulled nuclear pioneers remain in service in the fleet today. And while they were verifying the concept of nuclear power for submarines, a conventionally powered boat with lines like a whale was proving out new concepts in hull design and centralized control systems. The Albacore, a return to the spindle shape John Holland had used for his submarines half a century earlier, was showing the way to high speed maneuverability at much greater operational depths. 
By the early 60s, the new hull design, control system improvements and nuclear power were all coming together in Skipjack, first of the new breed of attack submarines. Other improved classes have followed. Until today, fleet nuclear attack submarines modeled after Skipjack are the most modern the world has ever known. Nuclear attack submarines are normally shorter than the conventional submarine. With a beam of about 32 feet and drawing about 30 feet. The hull form is essentially a tapered cylinder designed to withstand immense pressures at operating depths below 400 feet. Behind the dome, the entire bow is taken up by the acoustic array of an advanced active and passive sonar system. One of several types in the sonar suit that enables detection and tracking of targets at extreme long ranges. Torpedo tubes, customarily located in the bow, are angled outboard at midships instead. Diving planes forward are located on the sail. Aft control surfaces are grouped around a single propeller at the stern. The nuclear reactor is located inside a heavily shielded enclosure, isolated from components of the propulsion and auxiliary power systems. In nuclear submarines, the reactor is of the pressurized water type. That is, the coolant is water that is pressurized so it won't boil. Heated by the reactor core, the coolant circulates through a closed primary loop, giving up its heat as it generates steam in a secondary loop. Water circulating in the secondary loop is never in contact with primary water, and so there is little possibility of radioactive contamination. And it is steam from the secondary loop that drives the turbines both for propulsion and auxiliary power. Only nuclear trained operators are ever allowed to refuel, maintain, or repair these systems. At all other times, the enclosure remains tightly sealed, with the result that crews on patrol receive less radioactive radiation than they do from natural sources in the outside world. With no need to surface periodically for fuel, generating its own oxygen from seawater and continuously purifying the air, the nuclear attack submarine provides a comfortable living and operational environment. Fresh water is distilled by the many thousands of gallons each day. So daily showers are no problem at all. And there are laundry machines right on board. All spaces are air-conditioned. Crews appreciate additional space for relaxation. And rest that is simply not available aboard conventional boats. The mess room is multi-purpose. There's room for individual study and facilities for recreation while on patrol. In essence, the nuclear submarine is completely self-contained for underwater operations for months at a time, limited only by expendable supplies and crew endurance. With its clean lines and phenomenal power, the nuclear attack submarine is agile and responsive to the helm. Diving and climbing and banking on turns much like an aircraft. Providing maneuverability of the order demonstrated by a diving trainer. Indeed, with control columns and instrumentation grouped together like those in aircraft, one man could maneuver the ship alone. Although in practice today, two men are assigned. Coming to ordered course and depth is greatly simplified. The diving officer orders command information and a computer does the computing and integration, offsetting a guidance display. 
Controllers then use steering and diving controls to recenter the display. This automatically puts the submarine on course and at the specified depth. Once on patrol, the nuclear attack submarine rarely, if ever, surfaces. And yet, ship's position must be known with suitable accuracy at every moment anywhere in the world. The basic tool for tracking that position is SINs, the ship's inertial navigation system. An inertial platform senses minute changes in ship speed and direction. And complex computers use that information to maintain a continuous plot of ship's position automatically and with remarkable precision. But other systems are also available to check on the accuracy of those readings. Among them, a satellite receiver that uses the Navy satellites high in orbit to determine local position. Loran Alpha and Charlie long-range low-frequency radio using ground stations for position finding. And of course, the fabometer can be used for navigational purposes too. The attack submarine's tactical effectiveness depends on surprise, and yet it must remain in touch with command headquarters. Radio silence must be maintained. The submarine must not reveal itself by any means that can be detected by the opposition. Accordingly, the submarine fleet force commands use the Navy system of naval communication stations ashore to reach ships on patrol by way of the submarine broadcast. The naval station, just to be sure the submarine addressed gets the word, repeats the message on several scheduled broadcasts, each one copied in the submarine's communications room. Effective communications means effective control. And even with such one-way radio traffic, the Navy has shown that not a single message that affects mission success has ever been lost. So the nukes are never really out of touch, even for personal matters. Tactical effectiveness also depends on evaluating targets detected during long-range sonar surveillance and determining whether they are friend or foe before they are aware of the submarine's presence. Special processing of the information from various sonar arrays aboard the nuclear attack submarine helps classify targets so it can be determined if tracking and further action is necessary. At the fire control center, such information forms the basis for targeting inputs to weaponry, such as standard torpedoes and the acoustic types. But unlike conventional submarines, the nuclear attack submarine may also be equipped with subrock, a submarine rocket that launches a torpedo armed with a conventional or nuclear warhead into a ballistic trajectory over the water to an impact point in the vicinity of the target. Nuclear attack submarines then have unprecedented capabilities for operations in the undersea environment, formidable armament, high underwater speed, 20 knots or better, faster than it is on the surface, high maneuverability, operability at depths in excess of 400 feet, virtually unlimited range, and time on station limited only by crew endurance and expendable supplies. Patrols typically last 60 days or more. As a practical matter, there is no limit to the missions assignable to nuclear attack submarines as they patrol the seas of the world keeping surveillance over the naval operations of potential aggressors. And as part of the Navy's general warfare forces, 
the nuclear attack submarine is fully capable of taking action against surface shipping. But the focus of naval warfare has shifted. The opposition has nuclear submarines too. And as nuclear submarines run faster and dive deeper, surface anti-submarine warfare forces have increasing difficulty in tracking them down. The best way to find and attack a nuclear submarine, it's been said, is with another one. And so, by virtue of their special capabilities, our nuclear attack submarines have as their primary mission anti-submarine warfare. But the military forces of the United States have another broad strategic mission, that of deterring potential aggressors from initiating nuclear warfare against our nation, hoping by a massive first strike to wipe out our ability to respond. For a deterrent strategy to be effective, the potential aggressor must be convinced that our own nuclear missile forces cannot only survive the first strike, but will indeed be capable of inflicting unacceptable damage in retaliation. Part of our deterrent capability, of course, is assured by fast reaction intercontinental ballistic missile systems ashore. But it must be presumed that our launch sites are prime targets and carefully zeroed in. And at ballistic missile speeds, only 15 minutes is available for response between first detection and impact. Theoretically then, defensive systems must react within that time, evaluating and confirming the threat, launching retaliatory strikes before the launch sites themselves are attacked. Aware of these factors, the Navy in the 1950s was determined to offer an alternative form of deterrence. Nuclear missiles launched from mobile platforms beneath the sea, from nuclear submarines moving fast and secretly. Almost impossible to detect, and surely difficult to knock out simultaneously and completely, even by very large anti-submarine warfare forces. Any such attack would, of course, provide warning and lead time for the national defense and other units would be available to launch retaliatory strikes either immediately or at any future time, retaining a valid deterrent capability even if all other defensive options had been expended. With this in mind, the Navy pushed the development of solid-fueled rocketry, demonstrating with the Polaris A-1 missile that subsurface launches were indeed practical. To get the first launch platforms fast, the Navy redesigned hulls intended for nuclear attack submarines and inserted missile launch tubes and control facilities, adding missile launch to the already formidable capabilities of the nuclear submarine. And by November 1960, the first fleet ballistic missile submarine was on patrol. The 1,200 nautical mile range of the Polaris A-1 brought into reach a good percentage of land targets anywhere in the world. But Polaris had growth potential. Polaris A-1 was retired as Polaris A-2 became available, increasing range to 2,500 nautical miles and bringing every land target within range. But more importantly, the step increased the sea room in which Polaris submarines could hide. And Polaris A-2 has been followed by Polaris A-3, almost 85% new, adding new mission flexibility and reliability to the Navy's basic arsenal of ballistic missiles. And of course, succeeding classes of ships have been built from the keel up, specifically for their missions as fleet ballistic missile submarines. The hull retains the cylindrical contour of Skipjack and her sisters, and beam and draft dimensions and location of control surfaces are about the same. But due to the missile section aft of the sail, the fleet ballistic missile submarine is longer and heavier. Length typically is 400 feet, but her standard displacement of 8,000 tons compares with that of a cruiser. 
Torpedo tubes for self-defense if required are located in the bow and the sonar suit compares with that of some fast attack submarines. Internally, pressurized water reactors, like those of the nuclear attack submarines, are used for propulsion and auxiliary power. The environment is fully as comfortable, and even more attention has been paid to habitability to ease life aboard during lengthy patrols beneath the surface of the sea. Individual sleeping quarters are more spacious. There's room for individual study, often using audiovisual aids. Ample space is available too for group activity, but occasionally the mess and galley are left to the menu-minded and the gourmet cook. As a ship, the fleet ballistic missile submarine shares many similarities with its sister nuclear attack submarines. Control systems are centralized. Sophisticated navigational systems are provided for precise determination of ship's position. The need for precision is, if anything, even more critical aboard the fleet ballistic missile submarine. For while the target ashore is immobile, the launching platform is constantly in motion. So to compensate for this motion, the ballistic missile fire control computer regularly checks with SINs for ship's position information. Then every few seconds, it automatically recomputes and feeds updated launch and trajectory information to the guidance section of each missile for instantaneous use should it ever be required. This means that every missile aboard is ready to go toward its assigned target within minutes after the countdown starts, no matter where in the patrol area the submarine may be located. The most distinctive feature of the fleet ballistic missile submarine is, of course, Sherwood Forest, the launch tube complex for 16 missiles, and the launch control equipment associated with it. In the submarine, eight pairs of tubes reach from the keel through three decks to the superstructure topside. A small rocket motor generates steam in the base of the tube to launch the missile. Only after it breaks the surface does the solid fuel engine fire and the bird is on its way. Of course, we must constantly keep in mind as the launch drills continue that the fleet ballistic missile submarine is a deterrent. Its missiles capable of dealing more devastation in one strike than all the air raids of World War II. Should it ever be necessary to push the final button, the fleet ballistic missile submarine will have failed in its basic mission, preserving the peace. The important thing is to be constantly on patrol, in position to launch at a moment's notice, an obvious and continuing reminder to potential aggressors of the retaliation that will certainly follow in the event of attack. To this end, fleet ballistic missile submarines operate openly from bases at Charleston, South Carolina, and from tenders at Holy Lock, Scotland, and Rota, Spain in the Atlantic, and from Guam in the Pacific. A single patrol typically lasts about 60 days. The submarine manned for the period by one of its two crews, the blue or the gold. At patrol's end, the new crew takes over, followed by a short turnaround period for resupply and refurbishing, while the original crew returned stateside for rest and continued updating. The fleet ballistic missile submarine, meanwhile, has returned to duty in the patrol area, unseen, undetected, and soon virtually impossible to locate. With numerous fleet ballistic missile submarines continuously on patrol, the opposition knows he is vulnerable and can do little about it. 
He is forced to weigh carefully any aggressive move. That's the whole idea. Indeed, our nation's deterrent posture depends strongly on the Navy's fleet ballistic missile submarine. And that posture is being strengthened even more as Polaris is replaced by Poseidon, a new generation of solid-fueled ballistic missiles capable of delivering multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles over the same range as the Polaris A3. Even though heavier, larger in diameter, and longer than Polaris, only moderate changes are required in existing missile tubes to accept Poseidon. As it goes to sea carrying more potent payloads, the fleet ballistic missile submarine is an outstandingly practical example of the manner in which the Navy puts advanced science and technology at the service of the nation. Other submarine research and development programs continue to provide the knowledge and capabilities that will be required for undersea operations of the decades ahead. Both higher speed and quieter operation are important continuing goals. The Navy is planning a submarine designed to operate at higher speeds while submerged and also a method of transmitting power directly to the propeller shaft using electric motors thereby avoiding noisy reduction gears currently in use. Another highly significant goal is developing a capability for operations at increasing depths. The deep submergence rescue vehicle is designed to couple with a submarine escape hatch and remove two dozen crewmen at a time to safety. Increasing our scientific knowledge of inner space is of vital importance too and the Navy continues oceanographic research programs with such vehicles as Alvin and Autech 1 and 2 and Dolphin. Long-term operations below the surface are being studied using NR1, a nuclear-powered research vehicle that will greatly increase time available at depth. The discoveries that are made in these and other ongoing research and development programs will be reflected in the Navy's undersea craft of tomorrow. Just as today's submarines represent the best that science and technology have to offer in our time. The nuclear submarine is totally self-contained, totally independent of the need to surface for air. Nuclear attack submarines of the United States Navy have as their primary mission anti-submarine warfare while retaining an obvious capability against surface shipping. They range over the seas of the world in the first line of defense against overt aggression on or beneath the surface. And the Navy's nuclear-powered fleet ballistic missile submarines formidably armed with Polaris and Poseidon are an integral part of the nation's strategic deterrent against the threat of aggression. Silent, vigilant, eternally patrolling. Packing a mortal counterpunch, fleet ballistic missile submarines have as their primary mission the preservation of peace. It is a fitting objective for man's conquest of the last remaining frontier on Earth, the deep ocean.